So we're kicking off a brand new series uh, today called Check Your Heart, where we're going to be spending the next few weeks checking on the spiritual condition and the spiritual health of your hearts and mine. Now, this is a normal practice when it comes to the physical condition of our hearts, okay? We, there's all sorts of different types of tests and different things to pay attention to with the health of our hearts. I'm now getting to the age where I cannot ignore the fact that I have a family history of high cholesterol, you know, like um, that. Thanks, Dad, <clears throat> for nothing. Um, and so baby aspirins, if that's a part of that, is in my future. Um, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, but <clears throat> um, also, the, the, the paying attention to your exercise and your diet, like all of that starts to matter for the health of your heart. And I, um, sp- speaking of diet, a, a version of that, uh, probably six, seven, maybe even about eight years ago, um, I started noticing, um, no, five years ago now, I started noticing I would have these random moments throughout the week um, where my heart would start beating in a very weird rhythm. Like I could feel it. Something was off. I'd get dizzy. I'd get lightheaded. Um, It happened once when I was speaking to our college students. It happened for about 30 seconds. I kind of just kind of have to hold it together and then it would go away. I'd get short, out of breath, like about to pass out. So I went to go see a cardiologist. And so I did an EKG. I did a cardio echogram, echo, echocardiogram. Hello. Um, and, you know, you kind of got a picture of my heart. So then I went sit down with the cardiologist and said, hey, listen, um, what you have is not life-threatening, but it is a, it's a heart arrhythmia where, the, you know, your, your heart starts to beat out of rhythm and, and, you know, affects the whole body. And so I was like, okay. Um, I was like, so how do, we, how do we fix it? He's like, well, I don't want to put you on medication. He's like, but let me start with a question. He asked because she said, "Hey, how much um, how much coffee do you drink a day?" And I was like, "Well, it feels like a trap, first off." <laughs> and so, you know, you're not supposed to lie to your doctor, especially when it's your heart. So I was like, "You know, I, it depends, doc. Uh, three, four. Who's counting? You know, five sometimes cups a day." And he goes, "Okay." He goes, "That's a lot." And I was like, "Thank you. Um, how much do you drink?" You know. Um, <clears throat> He goes, here's what I want you to try. He was like, before we do anything else, he's like, I want you to drink one cup of caffeine a day and then you can have as much decaf as you want and let's see what happens. I was like, okay. And I, it fixed it. I didn't have a, it doesn't fix it. I still have the arrhythmia, but it has not flared up since that advice, since 2018. So diet, exercise, there are so many different things that we can do for the health of our heart, so many different tests to learn about our heart. So my sermon today is one cup of caffeine a day, decaf as much as you want, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly, I'm kidding. All right. Um, But the livelihood of, like your livelihood matters, which is why the health of your heart matters. But the same is true for the spiritual health of our hearts as well. Solomon uh, writes this in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Right? A lot of you know this. He says, above all else, guard your heart. <laughs> when I was in middle school and high school, um, we, we would like talk about this in terms of dating. Hey, guard your heart. Hey, you know, hey, he won't guard your heart. I will. You know what I mean? This is not a dating verse, okay? Um, He says, above all else, guard your heart. Why? For everything you do flows from it. Everything you do, every action, every word, every thought, everything you do flows from your heart. So guard it. This is of the utmost importance. In fact, some translations say, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of your life. And this metaphor of a wellspring, the metaphor of the heart flowing into everything that we do is very intentional. Think about a a spring, a wellspring. It flows into streams below it. Well, if the spring, if that wellspring gets polluted, it's going to affect every stream that comes out of it. And if the spring gets polluted and the downstream from it gets polluted, then it will impact every bit of life that is downstream from the spring. And the same is true for your heart and for mine. Um, In fact, 
Have you ever, we don't, if you're, if you're a Christian, we used to do this way more. It, it seemed like kind of cool and convicting. Now it's just kind of lame, so we make fun of it. But have you ever told somebody to check their heart? Anyone ever told you to check your heart kind of back in the day, like you did something, you said something that you shouldn't have said, okay? Uh, or, or, and, or, you know, and they just looked at you and they were like, hey, you need to check your heart, bro. You know, it was just one of those. And it, it, it was silly. Now it's just kind of funny to, to talk about it. But what was the implication? You did something, you said something, you acted out on the outside. And so it's like we intuitively knew there was something going on on the inside. So, um, the health of your heart matters physically, but especially spiritually, because it impacts every single area of your life, relationally, spiritually, professionally, mentally, and emotionally. So over the next three weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to unpack three tests, three indicators, if you will, that give us an idea of the health of our hearts. And today, today, we're going to start with our Words. We're going to start with our words. Now, whenever we talk about words in church, okay, um, typically what we talk about is that our words are powerful, and they certainly are. The scriptures talk about how powerful our words are, that they, they have the power to give life and to build people up, and they have the power to tear people down and to take life. We've all been on either side of good and bad, powerful Words. They are certainly powerful, but here's what we're going to learn from Jesus today in this interaction that he has with the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15. That yes, our words are powerful, but a step before that is this. Our words are also revealing. Like a symptom, right? A symptom is a sign of a deeper issue. Like when you're sick, your symptoms aren't the problem. They certainly feel like the problem. Um, and you can treat the symptoms, and we do that to feel a little bit better. But until the source of the problem is fixed, those symptoms are just going to reoccur. The symptoms are a sign that there's something deeper going on. So here in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus finds himself yet again responding to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, an objection that they have, um, and a complaint. And here's the complaint in Matthew chapter 15, verse 2. Uh, they come to Jesus and they say, hey, why do your disciples, the ones that you teach, you're their rabbi, you're their teacher, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Now, oftentimes in these moments, what they say is, hey, why do you not keep the law of Moses? Or what do you think the law says? But here we have something very, very different. They ask him a question. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Okay, we, we got to set this up a little bit to understand what happens in the rest of the interaction. Um, that the nation of Israel was given the law, the law of Moses. It ended up being 613 commands. They were written down, and that was Torah. But then you have something totally different, the tradition of the elders. And what the tradition of the elders were, they were add-ons to Torah. Man made by the Pharisees and religious leaders, man made add-ons to the Torah. And there were basically rules um, for daily living that were passed down orally. They were not recorded eventually after the time of Jesus. They were recorded in what is known as the Mishnah. Um, but th they, they were not given from God. There were these man-made rules. And initially they had good intent. Kind of the best way to describe it is that the, the tradition of the elders was, um, they called it building fences around the law building fences around Torah. So if you had a law that was commanded by God, what they would do is they would create other laws that, that were less severe, and so they would build a fence around a certain law and build other fences so that if you broke one of the lesser laws, it kind of stopped you from, that you, you, you stopped you before you broke the actual law. So it had good intent. It was kind of like a, a guardrail. However, however, um, for what, what ended up starting to happen with the Pharisees and the religious leaders and the teachers of the law is that these man-made um, tradition of the elders, they started to carry in their eyes as much authority as Torah, as their law, and in some cases carried even more authority than Torah. And when you build in offenses, even with initially good intent, what you start doing is you begin misapplying the original law. You begin completely missing the very heart of the initial law. And what we see here in the first century is that these, the tradition of the elders began to be a burdensome thing for any first century person trying to practice Judaism. So, this is the tradition of the elders. So there, there were all sorts of different traditions of the elders that were added on, but there was one in particular that they were up in arms about. And so they asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? And he goes on to say, 
they don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, depending on who you are, and I pass no judgment, you see this sentence kind of, you see this moment from one of two angles. For one, some of you might be like, okay, have they run out of things to talk to Jesus about? You know, like, I got nothing. I can't get this guy. He's too smart. He always has an answer. So you know what? Now I'm just going to get mad because Peter forgot to wash his hands before dipping the pita in the hummus. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm just going to get mad at that. And we need to talk about it. But some of you are kind of like with the Pharisees. Like, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty gross. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, they, I, the, the, the disciples were clearly the type of people that ignored the employees, washed their hands before they go to work sign. I would never go to Matthew's pita pit. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm good. I, I'm with the Pharisees on this one. Sorry, Jesus. Love you. But right. <clears throat> what's happening here? here here's, here's what is and what isn't happening here. For the Pharisees, this was not a matter of personal hygiene. It was way deeper than that. It was way bigger than that. It was not just a matter of personal hygiene. This was a matter for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, a matter of personal holiness. It was a matter of personal holiness. Now, what the Pharisees have done here in this moment is there were laws surrounding priests ceremonially washing their hands in different instances before um, carrying out different practices and serving different types of food. Um, And what they decided to do was they decided to take those specific laws and build fences around those laws so that now suddenly everybody that touched anything and ate anything had to wash their hands just like the priests did. And this was a very specific type of hand washing. They'd take a, uh, uh, someone would take some kind of jug or whatever, and they would pour water from the top of the wrist down, and they'd wash their hands with what would have been symbolizing running water. They did not wash their hands in a basin, which would have been very normal, because if you're washing your hands in like a bowl or something, then you're washing your hands in contaminated water, and so it wouldn't get clean, right? It makes sense. Also makes me wonder why we give kids baths. But <clears throat> anyways... So, so there's a very specific type of washing hands. And the intent was this. The intent of this practice was to remove anything that had the potential to defile. To remove anything that defiled a person, that polluted a person. Another way to think about defiled is spoiled or contaminated or made somebody impure. Or the word that we see over and over and over again in the Old Testament in a lot of moments with Jesus' intentions with the Pharisees um, is they wanted to avoid anything that would make them unclean. To be unclean was a spiritual condition. For the Pharisees. To be unclean was a spiritual condition for anybody in Judaism. To, to be unclean um, meant that you were unholy. That, that to be unclean was to be unacceptable and even in some cases detestable to God. But the Old Testament, when it, when it talks about the law that was given to Israel, it was given to them to set them apart from every other nation and every other people. And that word, that phrase set apart, that's what holy means. The word holy, it means set apart, uncommon. So that if you are not holy, then you're not set apart. You're common. You're kind of mixing with everybody and everything else. And so the Old Testament law that was given to the nation of Israel was meant to make them holy, to set them apart from everybody else. And so there were various things um, throughout the law that could make you ceremonially unclean. Touching certain animals, um, uh, different things that you could and you could not eat. And and some of them weren't, they weren't all sins. Like some of them were just very natural things that would happen. And, And if you became unclean, it wasn't mean you were like done for. You just had to go through a purification process. This is all in the Old Testament. This was God's way in the Old Testament. This was God's way of showing people his holiness and our sinfulness. His holiness and our brokenness and our sinfulness. Now, that is not the case for us today because Jesus came to introduce something brand new. But for the Pharisees, for the Pharisees, um, out of fear of becoming unclean and therefore unholy and not acceptable to God, um, they took this idea of, of being unclean. They built these fences around this idea of specifically washing your hands and they took it too far. And where they took it was, okay, if your hands aren't washed the way that the priests washed their hands, then the implication was, then if they were unclean, then the food that you touched was unclean. And then the food that you ingested made you unclean. It made the whole body unclean and unacceptable God. And that was to be avoided at all costs. So 
Jesus, in the verses immediately following, he kind of responds immediately to their hypocrisy. He kind of points out how they actually don't keep the tradition of the elders and everything, right? The way they treat their mothers and their fathers is not in keeping with the tradition of the elders. So he calls out their hypocrisy, and then he specifically gets to their objection of disciples not washing their hands. So he says in verse 10, just a few years later, he says, Jesus, so Jesus, then he calls out to the whole crowd, and he says, hey, listen and understand. Hey, listen and take this to heart. Jesus goes on. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Now, for us, it's like, okay, I don't even fully know what he's talking about. But this would have been a revolutionary idea for anybody in the first century. For any Jewish, even for his disciples, this would have been a revolutionary idea. This would have cut across so many different rules and religious practices that guided their day to day. I mean, there were whole, you know, there were whole um, animals and things that you could not eat, you could not touch. It would make you unclean. I mean, this was, this was unbelievable. This is unlike anything any first century Jew would have ever heard. What Jesus was teaching them was a brand new way of holiness, and they just didn't know it yet. Now, Matthew doesn't directly um, describe for us how offended the Pharisees got at this comment, but here's what he does give us. We knew they were upset. He goes on, then the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him, hey, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Hey, Jesus, just in case, sometimes I feel like you have trouble reading the room. <clears throat> They didn't like that one. Did you, did you have to go to the diet stuff? Like, you know that's a hot button issue for them. Did you, did you have to go there? They're pretty upset. And Jesus, I love this response. Listen, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. This is Jesus shrugging them off. This is Jesus for, well, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Hey, what they're teaching, so confidently, Jesus is saying, it won't last. It does not have deep roots in the new that I have brought to establish. And they can't see my new way because their pride and their self-righteousness is getting in the way. Jesus came to introduce a brand new moral standard for holiness, a brand new moral standard for what it means to be set apart, a brand new indicator for the spiritual health of the individual. And it did not have to do with whether or not they ate with unclean hands in the spiritual sense. And what's next? It's kind of hilarious, I think. You've got, there's so much humor in, in the Gospels. It's like, if somebody was making this up, they would not have put this stuff in there, okay? Because the thing about what just happened, Jesus just got done telling his disciples in the nicest way possible, hey, they're dumb, they don't get it, okay? Just leave them alone, they're blind. They are blind guides leading the blind and they're gonna both fall in the pit, like just, just leave them, okay? And so you gotta imagine the nervous laughter of the disciples who they're like, yeah, there's those, there's those two, but I can't believe they don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, they're idiots. <clears throat> and then Peter, Peter said what all of them were thinking. <clears throat> uh, yeah, hey, I don't, I don't get it. Can you, can you explain this parable to us? I don't, sorry, G Jesus, I was, I, I, I tried. I tr Matthew's faking. He has no idea what you're talking about. Uh, he, they're lying. We, none of us know what you're talking about. Can you explain this to us? Even to them, this would have been a revolutionary idea. <laughs> Jesus' response, <clears throat> are you still so dull? <laughs> that, this doesn't mean, okay, this, that, like, literally that Greek word means, are you still without understanding? I was like, Peter, and this word you is plural in the Greek, so he really is talking to the whole group now. They really are word lost. Like, oh, man, you guys were not the sharpest crayons in the box, okay? Are you, okay? Do you not get it? So then Jesus uses this as a teachable moment to teach them. He goes, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? 
Basic human anatomy, people. She's like, come on, like, you, Peter, you're, you're pretty regular. You understand this, okay? Like, <laughs> what goes in works through the intestines and right back out. Very, very normal bodily function, okay? It's how you were created. So then, but the things that come out of a person's mouth, and then Jesus is about to get to the heart of the issue. It's not what goes in. But the things that come out of a person's mouth, he says, come from the heart, and these defile them. These make them unholy and unlike God. The evil, the harmful, untrue words that come out of our mouths defile, Jesus said. Why? Because the evil that comes out is an indication of evil that is within. Words that come out of the mouth get their start, according to Jesus, in the heart. And then Jesus takes it even a step further. He says, for out of the heart, out of the heart, come evil thoughts murder and adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. It's not the external that determines our spiritual condition or health, but Jesus says, no, no, it's the internal because the heart is the source of all of that. The heart is the source of good and it is also a source of bad. It is the source of everything that flows out of you. And Jesus here doesn't give us an exhaustive list of things, but I do find it fascinating that every single one of the things that he points out negatively impacts another person. This is consistent with the New Testament ethic that Jesus came to establish, that there is no type of religious behavior or practice in the name of whatever religion you want to say, okay? I don't care what fences you're building. If it does not lead you to love another, then it is not aligned with the heart of God. And he makes a very clear connection here. That which defiles you, that which defiles you is detrimental to those around you. So it's not what goes in that defiles. It's what comes out. And not only does it defile you, it is detrimental to all of those around you. So he says, going back to verse 19, for out of the heart, the source, the starting place, come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. And these, he says, these things, these things, these are what defile a person. These are the things that hurt other people. These are the things that make you unholy and unlike God. These are the things that are not consistent with my way. But eating with unwashed hands, that does not defile you. It might not be, it might be kind of gross, but it doesn't defile them. And I, I find it important to have this quick sidebar. Because some of y'all, I don't want to lose some of y'all. Jesus is not anti-washing hands before we eat, okay? I think Jesus is all about it. I think he'd love hand sanitizer if they had this back then, okay? Um, Jesus is not anti-washing hands. In fact, the washing of hands is, is really meant for physical protection of yourself and for others. And I actually find it really fascinating that in the Old Testament law, some of the, um, the cleanliness laws actually protected the people of God physically far before they knew anything about germs. Okay, it's a conversation for another day. But the point is this, Jesus wasn't anti-washing hands. His point was this. That something far more detrimental to you and to those around you than just what you think you ingest is what comes out of your mouth. Because that is a true indicator of what is going on on the inside of you. And there's this moment, a totally separate moment and a totally separate occasion in Luke chapter 6 where Jesus kind of gives us this commentary. In verse 43, he says, kind of expounds on this idea. He says, no good tree bears bad fruit. Because a bad fruit can only bear bad fruit, and nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Like, its internal makeup determines the fruit that it bears. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. You walk around, you see an apple tree that has apples. 
You call it an apple tree. A, a tree that has pears, you call it a pear tree, right? Without the fruit, you just, you just, I don't know if you're looking at it. You don't know what you're looking at. But then when it bears fruit, you can recognize the tree by its fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. Again, the internal makeup determines the fruit that is produced. So then he gets to the point. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And then the punchline, he says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What comes out of your mouth reveals what is in your heart, according to Jesus. Our words, yes, they're powerful for sure, but they are revealing. They are an indicator. Not that you're a bad person. Not that your heart is just all evil and you've got no shot. No, no, but it is an indicator of toxic things, unhealthy things, unprocessed things, sin, and evil that does exist inside of all of us. Our words are an indicator of toxic and unhealthy things stored up in our hearts. I'm telling you, this is true. This is true for all of us. And, and let me just try to make some practical connections here. And this isn't an exhaustive list, and this isn't all one for one, but just to kind of get us going in a direction to kind of figure out where this lands with us, okay? If, if you're prone to use harsh words, it might be because there's anger stored up in your heart. Like if, if harsh words are kind of your default with your spouse or with your kids or with people that you work with or even people that you don't know, like if it's almost just this immediate reaction is, is harshness, there might be some anger, unprocessed anger stored up in the heart. If you're prone to use critical words, it might be because there's insecurity stored up in your heart. To help you feel better about how you don't feel about good about yourself, it's easy to be critical of other people to make yourself feel and look better. If you're prone to belittling and demeaning words, it might be because there's envy stored up in your heart. If I can't have what they have, if I can't do what they do, if I can't experience the life that they're experiencing, then I'm just going to belittle them and all that they have and all they experience to make myself feel better. If you find yourself consistently using dishonest words, and, and for most of us, we're really the only ones that knows if this is happening, it might be because shame is stored up in your heart. Like you... You've experienced some things in the past, done some things in the past. There's parts of your story you're not proud of. Or maybe right here in this moment, there are things, there are sins, there are struggles, there are things in your story that you're not proud of. And shame has crept in there and is feeding you lies. Like this defines who you are and you are bad. And that shame that is in there, that toxicity, um, it, it, it makes you not want anybody to know the real you. And so dishonest words just flow too easily. Not even about that thing that you're trying to hide, but it could be about anything. Because the heart, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. For some of you, if defensive words are part of the struggle, and I can certainly relate. Like you, there's no room for feedback. Your immediate response, anyone that tells you how you can be better, do better, love better, is immediate defensiveness. It might be because there's pride more than you realized stored up in your heart telling you, I don't need this. If hurtful words like fighting words, like, like you know this, when you're in an argument and you know there's a sentence that could end it, there's a low blow that could end it, hurtful words that are meant to tear down somebody and to ruin their self-esteem, it might be because there's unforgiveness stored up in your heart and you know this, hurt people hurt people. Words, words, are an indicator of what is going on in here. And what is going on in here is going to make its way to the outside. And, and you can move these around. It's not one for one. This is just to help us get an idea of how this actually plays out practically in our life. And here's the hard part for me. This is just so convicting. That your words, 
what this is teaching us is that your words aren't just a heat of the moment thing. Ah, just, ah, that's not me. Your, your words, they're not just like, a, oh, that was an out of character moment. If we're just being real here today for you and for me, no, 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 it might be in the heat of a moment and there might be some things that trigger you to say certain things, but it's in here. And it's not an out of character moment. It's actually revealing of the way that your character can grow and some unhealthy things you've left unaddressed in your heart. But this is so helpful. This is so helpful for us because it means that we can monitor. We can monitor the condition of our hearts by paying attention to the words that we speak. Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. And, and a lot of times, especially, I don't know, you might have heard this growing up in the context of like vulgar language, okay, or like, hey, cuss words and all that. That's great, but that's way broader here, okay, than, 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 than what Paul was talking about here. Um, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. If you were to look up this Greek word unwholesome in the Greek dictionary, there are two major entries for the way that this word can be interpreted. So unwholesome, the two major categories are this, unhelpful words and unhealthful words. And I know what you're thinking, yeah, that's a word, okay? You can look it up. I know it doesn't look one, but you can look it up, okay? I didn't just make this up, okay, preacher boy, okay? This is a real word. It doesn't sound like it though, does it? I promise though it's real, okay? You were to look up unwholesome, it's two categories, unhelpful and unhealthful. Unhelpful meaning words that add little to no value to the other person or the situation. That they're, they're poor in quality, just rotten and useless. And unhealthful words, words that, are dis, um, words that are detrimental to anybody on the other side of those words. Words that are evil in a moral sense that hurt other people. So unhelpful and unhealthful. And if you find yourself in any situation where unwholesome words, unhelpful or unhealthful words coming out of your mouth, here's what we should all get better at doing. And if you're a follower of Jesus, here's what you have to do. Here's what is required of you to do. If you find yourself in moments where unwholesome talk is coming out of your mouth, we need to stop and we need to ask this really difficult question. What am I storing up in my heart? What's in there? Don't just brush it off as a weak moment, as a, oh, I was tired moment, oh, I've just had a hard day moment, or my favorite, I'm just stressed, there's a lot going on, it's not you, it's me. That doesn't help anything. When unwholesome talk is coming out, to stop and to ask. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't get a decision in this. It's to stop and to ask. What am I storing up in my heart? Is it anger? Is it bitterness? Unforgiveness? Insecurity, envy, pride, shame, fear, some secret sin. Like what am I storing up in my heart? And this, I'm just going to be honest with you, this is a scary question for some of us. And this is hard work to dig in and to figure out what's going on in here. It's a vulnerable work. It'll be humbling work. In fact, for some of us, we might even find the answer to this question a little bit humiliating. It's far too introspective for some of us and, and, and beyond what we're comfortable with. But it is a necessary work. And it is a question that puts us in the way of Jesus. And so are you willing to ask this question and make yourself aware Step number one, facing the music of that which your heart is full of and stop making excuses for it because there are symptoms that are signs of a deeper problem. And then would you be willing to own it, whatever it is that is in there, no matter how humbling or how humiliating or how embarrassing, would you be willing to own it? And then would you be willing to ask yourself, okay, why is this in there? How did this get in there? 
And then might you be so willing to maybe invite others into the process? In fact, curiosity and awareness around this idea, um, it might actually require somebody else. It might actually require somebody else's perspective, which is a pretty terrifying thing. But then, it's telling you, you, you're willing to ask the question. You don't brush it off and make excuses. You make yourself aware, willing to own, ask why it's there. What you start doing is you begin to create space for God to work in your heart and to change that is what is within you. That he might begin to root out those things. And you're a part of this too. That he might begin to soften parts of your heart that have been hardened for far too long. Confessing, calling it out, owning and praying and bringing other people in and making room for God to transform your heart. I'm just telling you, at least for me, this principle and Jesus' teaching, I'm just telling you, it gives me a brand new perspective and it should give you a brand new perspective on the words that come out of your mouth. Like it totally changes the way that I approach whenever unwholesome language comes out of my mouth in a conversation with my wife. It totally changes my approach whenever unwholesome language comes out of my mouth and the way that I'm talking to my kids. Or in the way that I'm talking to people that I don't know, the way that I'm interacting with anybody, it totally changes the way that I see that which is coming out of my mouth. It's not just a weak moment. I've got some character flaws and I've got some stuff in here that I've got to root out. Some pride stuff, some anger stuff, some stuff that I need my counselor to keep showing me. Come on. What about you? Above all else. Guard your heart. Because out of it flows everything that you do. And it touches every relationship that you have. So guard it. And a part of guarding is doing the interrogative work to figure out, okay, what has infiltrated? What has spent too much time in there? What have I been storing up? Knowing that what is on the inside, it's going to make itself its way to the outside. And it might defile me, and it most certainly will be devastating to those around me. So, you want to check in on the health of your heart? Step one, pay attention to your words. But it starts here. And this is why, you can't miss this. This is why Jesus was not interested in just behavior modification. I'm all about, man, you gotta, sometimes you, you, you've got to work hard and we've got to pay attention. And I think following Jesus, it certainly changes your behavior. But Jesus did not come just for you to change your behavior. He was interested in way more than that. He wants to transform you. That, that evil, that evil, that propensity for bad and wrong that we all have, that so naturally flows out of us, that so naturally just kind of defines the words that come out of our mouth. Whenever we surrender more of who we are to Jesus and make ourselves aware, be willing to own and open ourselves up to more of Jesus, what was once unnatural for us to do becomes far more natural as Jesus is formed in us. Life-giving words, healthy words, loving words, encouraging words, all rooted in a healthy heart become far more natural where they were once unnatural because Jesus is now more formed in me because I was willing to surrender and say, Jesus, make me more like you. Be aware, own it, and commit to the process. That's why Jesus didn't just come to forgive you. He came to transform you an internal purity that makes its way to the outside. And this was the biggest problem for the Pharisees. They had the wrong order of operations. They tried to deal with the external and they built so many fences in the name of religion thinking they were doing it right. They, without even knowing it, cut God off to do any work on the end. 
eternal. But let it not be so with us. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Unhelpful and unhealthful, but when it does, pay attention and ask, what am I storing up in here? Make yourself aware, be willing to own and surrender to Jesus. Invite him in. Make room for God to change and to transform that which is within you and me. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that in these next few moments, would you give us the courage to face the music of what is inside of our hearts? Give us the courage to honestly ask the question, what am I storing up? Would you give us the perspective that our words are not just random, having a bad day, but a reflection of what is on the inside? So Father, I pray that you would press upon all of our hearts that which might be on the inside, the toxic that is contaminating all that flows out. And as we bring that and confess that to you and bring other people into the process, may you transform us. That Christ may be formed in us more so that we might reflect more of his goodness, especially with what comes out of our mouths. We love you. We ask that you begin to do a work in us today. We lay it all before you. We give it all to you. We surrender all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.